Suppose there is a God. Let's start with that supposition. And suppose that God is altogether absolutely holy. And suppose that God, not out of any necessity within himself, but out of sheer love and graciousness, creates a world. And he inhabits this world with a vast array of animals and plants. And then when he's finished, his crowning act of creation is a creature that he shapes in his own image and breathes into this creature his own breath and gives this creature preeminence over all of creation, dominion over all the world, and gives him the task of mirroring and reflecting God's own holy character. Is there any, is there any thing going on we need to announce? Is there an upcoming? There's a bass tournament October 12th. Okay. And That's then quick. I need to double check the shape, but I think they're doing basketball again on Tuesday nights. Okay. I know there's uh, I know there's a Thursday night crew that's been coming for sure. At one point there was a bowl. So uh, if you're interested in, in uh, maybe coming up for basketball, and Tuesday night would be a good night for you. You might check with Shane Rob. If you don't know how to do that, we'll get you in contact with him. And uh, Thursday night is a group, and if you just want to double check on that, uh, contact Matt Hill. Uh, you could know for sure. But both of those have been options uh, recently. So, uh, And then the Bass Tournament on the 12th. So those are some things that you can get plugged into outside of our regular routine of Sunday school worship and our Bible study. So, let me pray for us as we start. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the men that are here, and Lord, for the group that will gather Saturday. Lord, uh, grateful to have the opportunity to uh, speak into the lives of our men, and uh, Lord, to speak about you. Uh, Father, to uh, to speak of who you are and your character, and to raise our our thoughts about that to increase our faith regarding you to give us more uh, in our minds and hearts to contemplate upon about you to to create a framework in our lives for uh, stability when when the waters begin to churn on our lives to be able to know more of who you are and what your character is will bring stability to us. And Father, we know as, uh, as men, uh, our, our wives and our children, our grandchildren, look toward us, toward stability. When crisis hits, they look to see how we're reacting. Uh, and Father, our anchor will be stronger by knowing more of you. And so, Lord, inform us today, not just so we have knowledge, but God, to increase our faith. Pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. If uh, if you have a, a notebook that has a schedule in it, I uh, just want to point out the the uh, schedule for the rest of our semester time together. Uh, if you don't have one of those, we can get you one this morning. Uh, a notebook, and all of them have a schedule included. Um, just want to point out, there's we're we're moving into October, and today we're talking omniscience. This is the first. And so you can see how far we go. Uh, we have one week in here in October that's a break, and we've got it listed as fall break. There's really two weeks of fall break that are impacting our church this year, uh, just because of the way school schedules fall. So, depending if you have a if you have school age children, depending on uh, which school they're in, your fall break week may fall different than ours. That doesn't affect us a whole lot on Tuesdays because uh, fall break doesn't end, begin till the end of the week, right? But it affects Saturday, guys, especially. So, guys, on Saturday, if, uh, if that's going to affect your Saturday, just know and look at the schedule and be certain of which one is meeting. And, of course, it's on video, so you'll be able to catch up. So, uh, just want to point that out to you so that there's no confusion going forward and, and just remind you of where we're headed. That'll 
hopefully help you. Who's the smartest person you know? That's the, the first question I have for you today. We're talking about God's omniscience. We're talking about knowledge today. Uh, who's the smartest person you know? There's a smart guy, Albert Einstein. Theory of relativity. I know how to say that. I know his famous formula, E equals MC squared. I don't know that I know any more than that <laughs> about what he knows, but uh, uh, or knew, I guess. Uh, he's a smart guy. He was mentioned earlier. Uh, Bill Gates. He's pretty smart. Uh, if not just in how to keep making more money, right? Uh, but uh, for some people, they may say, from their perspective and world, that's the smartest guy I know. Y'all probably have heard of Stephen Hawking. Uh, us growing up, our, our generation, when somebody's really smart, we'd call him an Einstein. Uh, the younger generation would say he's wicked smart. He's a Hawking. Right? Uh, Stephen Hawking built on Einstein's theories and uh, uh, included quantum mechanics and came up with a lot of new information, black holes, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and uh, he's done it all from a wheelchair. He has ALS. So, uh, he's a smart guy. If you know who he is, uh, some of these other names you may not be as familiar with. I wasn't. Uh, this is Kim Un Yong. Uh, he has an IQ of 210, and uh, at the time he was tested, um, Guinness Book of World Records listed him as the smartest person in the world based on IQ testing. Uh, by the age of two, he was fluent in four languages, uh, meaning he was reading four different languages. Um, at the age of four, he was auditing college courses, uh, and at the age of eight, NASA had invited him to come to the United States to study. Um, so that's a pretty smart guy. That's a picture of him more recently and, and uh, when he was young, working some mathematical formula, solved the differential of something. So it looks like calculus. Um, here's a smart guy, Sir Andrew Wiles. Um, he is uh, the man who. Uh, he's a British mathematician, but he's the man who solved what is called the world's most difficult math problem. Uh, I think it's called Fermat's Last Theorem. Uh, I don't have any clue what that means or says, right? Uh, but uh, if he can do that, I figure he's pretty smart. Christopher Garata. Age 14, he enrolled, enrolled at Caltech. At 16, he was working with NASA. And by 22, he had a PhD from Princeton in astro, astrophysics. So that sounds pretty smart to me. Uh, that's a picture of him working some formula. Here is Terence Tao. He also got a PhD from Princeton at the age of 20, but he was doing calculus at two. And at nine, he was taking college level math. He became the youngest full professor at UCLA when he was 24 years old. Uh, so, another smart guy. These are smart people. Uh, I, I don't know who the smartest person you know is. You may know some of those names. You may know other people. That, I mean, I, does that make us smart? I don't know if those things actually make us smart. How do we measure intelligence? How do we measure how smart somebody is? Uh, we can do the IQ testing thing. Uh, just about everybody falls in the same range of IQ, and then there's a real small percentage that falls below that and is considered deficient. And there's a, a, a very small percentage that is well above that in the uh, 190 plus range where all these guys were. Uh, is, is, it, is it that? Is it ability to uh, score well on some kind of uh, test and create a quotient of intelligence? Is that how you measure smartness? Is it accomplishment? Uh, I, we, we know some people that on IQ test may not score outside of the average norm, but the things that they're able to accomplish and 
and do in their given lifetime uh, shows some amount of intelligence, right? Uh, their ability to uh, achieve and accomplish. Um, is that how we would measure it? Is it on tests? Is it on accomplishments? What is knowledge? That's what we're talking about. What is knowledge? Well, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, uh, if I can find the word there, I'd like to hear what he had to say from back then, because um, it has a, a distinctive Christian slant. Uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary says, a clear and certain perception of that which exists, or of truth and fact. A clear and certain perception of that which exists, or of truth and fact. Uh, knowledge. You know what's out there, right? What you can see and perceive, what you know to have truth or has factual backing. If you possess information in those areas, then you possess knowledge. Possess knowledge. That's what knowledge is according to his definition. Uh, that implies a process of learning or of developing skills, right? Uh, there's learning. A, a person's world starts really small, and a child can be really intelligent based on the information that they have been given, right? Uh, but compared to somebody else who's lived longer or lived in a different sphere of existence, knows more information, has a clear and certain perception of other things that exist, of which that child would have no knowledge of, right? Uh, so, it implies learning. Eventually that scope has to increase. It implies development of skills where you can find more truth and more fact. Skills include the ability to do research and find out information. So that implies learning and skill development. But what about God's knowledge? What about God's knowledge? We would say God has perfect knowledge. God has perfect knowledge. Not just knowledge, but he has perfect knowledge. That's what omniscience is. We usually say omniscience means uh, having all knowledge. Um, I think the better word is perfect knowledge. God has perfect knowledge. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about these verses here in a minute. So uh, you're not going to see them in print. So if you want to begin to find Isaiah, uh, you can. <coughs> God has perfect knowledge. Is this because God has the capacity to perceive all that exists? Think about Webster's definition. Is it? Be, it's a clear, right? It's a clear perception of all that exists, of truth, and fact. Is God's perfect knowledge because He has this capacity to perceive all that exists and to learn all truth and all facts? Is that why God's knowledge is perfect? Because His capacity for knowledge is larger than ours, maybe the largest ever. He's just, he's had eternal time to learn all things. Is that why his knowledge is perfect? And, and, and if that's how you would say that's God's perfect knowledge, would that be a God worth our undying worship? Do we want to worship a God that simply had enough time to learn all things? and to kind of study and perceive all things, and would that, would that create in us an undying worship of Him, a commitment and an absolute trust in His being and existence? Would that be a God to whom we would entrust ourselves and trust our family and trust our future and trust our eternity with, simply because He's had the opportunity to perceive all things that we're aware of? Would we not ask the question, could there possibly be things that we're unaware of that he doesn't know about? He knows all things that we're aware of. We trust that. But could it be there's things that exist that he hasn't been able to study yet or hasn't been able to come to knowledge of? I think that would have to be a question we would answer if that's how you define what his perfect knowledge is. Most of the religions of the world have multiple gods because no one god is sufficiently knowledgeable or powerful, right, to deal with all the possibilities. And so, from ancient time up through current day, you have these people that worship gods 
within their religion because this is the God of this, and this is the God of that, and this is the God that knows this, and this is the God that helps me in this area, and this, right? Uh, <laughs> we're not talking about that. We're talking about a God, one God. What about the many gods worshipped in what we would call uh, contemporary or modern Middle America? What about the gods that are worshipped right here? Even the people that, if you were to ask them, what's your religion? Many of them, on some kind of survey, would check Christian or uncertain uh, or atheist, maybe. A very small percentage would. Uh, but they really, in all of those categories, worship a lot of different gods right here in our midst. What about those gods? I'm talking about the gods of prosperity and material wealth. Those gods. What about the gods of power and prestige? What about the gods of living longer? I'm going to do everything I can to live longer. And, and I want to get more enjoyment out of life than anybody else. I'm just going to, I'm going, to, I'm going to live an existence that's full of enjoyment. And so whatever that takes, I want to enjoy this, because this is all there is. And, and they're worshiping at the feet of the God of live long and enjoy what you get. Or the gods of celebrity or fame. We worship these gods, and we manufacture idols to represent them. I mean, we are, we are world manufacturing idols. Banks and stock markets are, are brick and mortar structures, uh, whether it's a business we're building or homes to represent our material wealth or our power or our prestige, or it's the cast metal and fiberglass of our toys, our cars, our boats, our planes, our whatever we can get and buy and, and show this is my idol because I'm worshiping at the feet of something else. Or maybe it's um, weight rooms and chemistry labs. <laughs> We're trying to live longer. Maybe that's our idol. Um, or the production houses of movies and television and sports that are creating all these idols where we worship. I think we miss the irony of the ancient worshiping of pagan gods and the modern worshiping of pagan gods in these verses of Isaiah 42 or 44 and Isaiah 46. Let me just read a portion of these texts to you out of those chapters. Uh, Isaiah 44, verse 12 begins The man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. He makes his tools. He also gets hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a man, so that it may sit in his house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also uh, uh, makes a fire to break bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat as he roasts a roast. And is satisfied, he also warms himself and says, Aha, I'm warm. I've seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. Isaiah picks up on this theme in chapter 46. <clears throat> to whom would you liken me, God now speaking, to whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we would be alive? How do you compare me to these other gods you worship? Compare me. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. They bow down, indeed they worship it. They lift it upon the shoulder and carry it. 
They set it in its place and it stands there. It does not move from its place. Though one may cry to it, it cannot answer. It cannot deliver him from his distress. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. All these gods that get worshipped, whether ancient wood or gold that they set in their house, or the gods we worship of our ideologies, our philosophies, or our stuff, have no knowledge. None of those gods possessed any knowledge because they're inanimate. They're not real. They're untrue. This is the God who declares the end from the beginning. <laughs> you can't declare something you don't know. He's declaring the end. We'll go that way with future. From the beginning. That which hasn't been done, that which has already happened. It's perfect knowledge. Nothing is passing him by. So he said, is our concept of God that he's been able to have enough time to study all these things, that's why he knows? Or does the concept of God's <coughs> knowledge mean something totally different than what we think of as knowledge? The ability to perceive clear conscience of that which exists, truth and fact, we should know the answer to that. We're looking at God and his character, we're reading this book on the holiness of God, and what is it teaching us? God is absolutely other than us. He's transcendent. He's completely other than us. And so when we begin to define anything about God from our perspective, this is what we know knowledge is, and we just say that must be how God has knowledge, he's other than us. He's in a different category than us. He's independent. He's infinite. He's invisible. He's immutable. He's ever-present. These are the things we've been talking about. None of that's true of us. So when we talk about knowledge, even though we can share it, remember the incommunicable attributes, we don't share in those with him, even though this is a communicable attribute, we can also have knowledge. He shares knowledge with us. His knowledge is still something totally different than us, apart from us. It's still totally different. So what is perfect knowledge? Perfect knowledge, or omniscience, according to Grudem, in Grudem's Systematic Theology, is this. God fully knows himself and all things actual and possible in one simple and eternal act. God fully knows himself and all things actual and possible in one simple and eternal act. So let's just break that definition down. Just take its parts. God fully knows himself. That was the first part of it. God fully knows himself. <clears throat> Do we fully know ourselves? No. The psalmist said, search me and know my heart. I, I, don't, I don't even know or get myself. Paul in Romans 7 said, why do I do the things that I hate and not the things that I love to do? He couldn't figure that out. We don't fully know ourselves. God fully knows himself. And that's a truly astounding statement when we realize that we've already talked about one of God's attributes is he's unfathomable. <laughs> you can't plumb his depths. Right? He, he's absolutely without limits. He's without limits, but he fully knows himself. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. The Spirit of God searches the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God because he's searching the depths of himself. He knows it. Okay? God knows himself fully. God knows all things actual. That's part of that definition. He knows all things actual. This is talking about all the things that exist and all the things that happen. All things actual. It exists and it happens. Hebrews 4.13, this is the memory verse that goes with this section. Uh, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, 
but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him of whom we have to do. That is a... Sproul talks about trembling before the presence of God to know that we stand as human beings created in his image before his very presence ought to be a trembling matter because all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him. Nothing remains hidden. Nothing of our secret intent, our motive, our heart. It's not just that he knows our actions. Right? He knows all things actual. He knows the thought. Okay. God knows. God knows what we need before we ask Him, right, according to the Scripture. He knows what we need before we ask. God knows the number of hairs on our head, right? Even if it's beginning to look like that, <laughs> He knows how many are there. God knows when a sparrow falls, Scripture says, right? God knows our thoughts. God knows the number of stars in the sky. I'd like to find where they took that shot, wouldn't you? Hmm. God knows the number of grains of sand on the beach. And if that's the scene from this place at night, that would be a great trip, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you could get this in the day and that night. Man. God knows. Not because he's learned it. He knows. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. <coughs> Verse 4. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You ever find yourself praying that way? I don't even know what to say but I hope you know what I need to say. And I believe that's true because he knows what's on my tongue before I do. Psalm 139, 16, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. You know what that means, right? Before we're born. I should have given a picture of a baby in the womb. We're a formed substance when we're, once we're there. You knew me before that. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Before I was ever born, the days of my life were laid out. He knows all things actual. He knows the words that we're going to say before we say them. He knew us before we were born. And he knows the day that we'll leave this existence. He knows all things possible. That's part of that definition. This means that God knows what might happen, but it never actually comes to pass. Have you ever thought about that? There's things that could happen that don't ever happen. God knows about that. Nothing's coming as a surprise. That's the way we would normally say, that, hey, this doesn't surprise God, or that wouldn't surprise God. He knows all things possible. Well, where do we get that? I mean, is that, isn't that just something we say that kind of comforts us? No, Jesus said to the Pharisees about Tyre and Sidon, He said, they, those nations would have repented if I had been there to perform the miracles that you see, He said to the Pharisees. They would have repented, but you don't. Was that just not hyperbole? No, He's saying, if I had gone there and performed these miracles, they would have repented. He knows all things possible. God knows the things he's capable of doing and has not done or will not do. God's capable of doing things that we haven't been able to observe, right? I mean, we look at the world and all the things that he's created. There's things he didn't create that he could have. And he knows them as intimate in detail as he knows the things he actually created. Did that make any sense? He knows all things possible. That's what we're saying. God knows everything in one simple act. What does that mean? Simple in terms of it can't be divided further into parts. That, that's one definition of simple. You can't break it down any further. 
He knows everything in one simple act. In saying he's always fully aware of everything. It's not that he's learned it. We talked about the hairs on our head. If, if, if you went to God and you were able to say, God, I want to know how many hairs are on my head, he wouldn't have to sit there and count them. It's not that he's got percep perceptive enough eyes to see all individual hairs. We could do that with a microscope, right? It's that he knows. He knows it. The stars of the sky, he doesn't have to remember back to when he created, right, and go, okay, on that day of creation when we did the stars, uh, Oh, yeah, I remember. It was it. <coughs> he knows it. Same with the sand or whatever it is. He knows it. He knows it. He doesn't learn it. It doesn't reside in his consciousness where he, oh, well, let me think about that. It's present in his consciousness now. He knows everything in one simple act. And he knows all things in an eternal act, in one simple and eternal act. His knowledge never changes, it never grows. <coughs> It's always been and always will be. From eternity, he's known all things that would happen and all things he would do and all things possible. It's eternal. It's never changed. It's never grown. So what? Okay, so that's God's perfect knowledge. So what? Isaiah 43.25 says, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God will not remember our sins. Aren't you grateful for that? It speaks to a New Testament grace that we know on this side of the cross and look back over and we say, I'm so glad I've forgiven. And God will not remember my sin. Now wait a minute. We just said God never forgets. <laughs> he knows all things. His 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 knowledge doesn't grow or change. So how can he have knowledge of my sin and if it never changes, how does he not remember it anymore? What we're saying is this. He forgets them in terms of his relationship to us. He doesn't allow the knowledge of it to affect the way he relates to us. It's not that he goes, what, you sinned one time? Uh, how did that... <laughs> He doesn't allow that to affect his relationship to us. <coughs> the knowledge of it, he doesn't remember in terms of relationship. We understand that in a simple way with our wives and our kids. Correct? I've done a lot of things over the 21 years Susan and I have been married to wound her. And gratefully and thankfully, although there's knowledge and memory of those woundings, she still resides with me as a devoted loving spouse. She doesn't allow the knowledge or memory of the times that I've wounded her to keep her from relating to me as a wife still. That's a good thing. I can't wipe out the memory. My kids have done things right, that I don't allow the knowledge of their mistake or sinfulness or whatever to affect the way that I'm relating to them. There's, we're still in a relationship. There's still love given, love received. That's what we're talking about there. I, I point that out to you to say, man, I don't, I, I don't want you to stumble over an attribute of God and this statement that is so treasuring to us. I, that God does not remember our sin is huge. But it's not because it gets wiped from His knowledge. It's that in His knowledge, He chooses to not let that affect our relationship because of what Christ did. Okay, that's a good thing. So what? God will not remember our sins. God's perfect knowledge provides great peace for us. This is my last so what. God knows all things perfectly. And since God has known us before creation began, He knew us in our unformed substance. Since God knew we would be born, in the time we were born, to the people we would be born to. He knows all the circumstances of our lives, he, even the moment of our death. He knows all these things. We're blessed with this great sense of peace that comes from that. Nothing's outside of God's vision or will for us. He knows all these things that are occurring. 
He even knew our sin. He knew our sin before we sinned. He knows what's on our tongue before it's spoken, even the bad stuff. He knows our thoughts, even the wrong ones. He knows all those things, and yet still provided His Son. With that perfect knowledge came perfect grace. And we can rest in this assurance and this peace that with all of that knowledge, God still revealed Himself to us to know Him. So know God in this way this morning. Believe in this God and live a higher life. Not the life that is offered by these things of our false gods. The metallic brick and mortar bedazzled gods of this world who know nothing of your existence. All of these gods that we worship and these idols that we create to represent our gods know nothing of our existence. And if we were to come into their knowledge, if that were possible, and in some of these things it's impossible, bricks and mortar don't have knowledge. But celebrities do. If we were to come into their knowledge, they wouldn't care any more about us than how much we bring value to them. And God cares about bringing value to us. When he doesn't need to at all, because he has all value already. Father, thank you for giving us your word that reveals you to us. We would have no knowledge of you apart from you giving us the not necessary knowledge to know you. And in your perfect knowledge, you gave us the knowledge we need to, to not only know about you, but to come to know you through your Son, Christ. And we worship at his feet today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, enjoy your small groups. Amen.